Hi, Karen Alari here. Today we're going to be painting this little painting path in the park and it's kind of a, a different one. It's still going to be a step-by-step -step from the very beginning type of painting. So no matter whether you're a beginner or a more advanced painter, I think you'll really enjoy painting this impressionistic colorful little painting uh, of a path in dappled light and some wildflowers and a sunlit grassy field behind it. The thing that's a little different about this one is I've been looking for a lower cost alternative in terms of paints and supplies because the important thing when you're beginning to learn to paint is well and all throughout your painting journey is to paint a lot and and not to be worried about the cost of the paints or the cost of the materials um, but without without giving up too much uh, the quality of the paint and the ability of the paint to move um, I wanted to find a paint that was a little less expensive so I've I've run across this Arteza brand paints and they're not paying me to uh, do this but they did send me some of their paints to try out and I was really pleased with the outcome this little painting was painted all with the Arteza uh, tw 12 acrylic paint set and I'll put the links down below in the description of the video so that you can get them if you like to but again my purpose in this you could paint this little painting using the paint you have or any paintings at all so the video itself is just going to be another step-by-step -step tutorial video that you can follow along with and hone your skills and create this little painting and so let's get started as usual you'll find all your supplies that you need down in the description and we'll get started on our little painting today okay first thing you're going to want to do is tone your canvas so this just covers up the white of the canvas and gives uh, you a tone to work with most of it will be covered up in the process of painting so it's not really critical what color it is you just want to make it light enough that you can draw your your drawing over the top of it and be able to see it. So I've chosen to use a combination of yellow ochre with a little bit of the scarlet red and a bunch of titanium white added to that. And you just take a larger brush and brush it all over the canvas, cover the canvas. Again, you don't have to worry about it being really smooth because we'll be covering this up with subsequent layers. You just want to cover up that white be sure all the little white sparkles are covered up and then you're going to want to let this dry completely before we go on and do the drawing phase and literally that may take five or ten minutes at most for it to dry and then we'll move on to the drawing for our reference today instead of using a photograph we're going to be using this little painting that I painted a little while ago it was painted, painted outdoors on location and I did paint this using golden acrylic paint so we'll be able to see the differences between those two. I'm also using a Masterson's Stay Wet palette and I'll put a link below in the description about how to set up your palette and how to arrange your paints so they work the best for you. So let's get started. Okay so to do the drawing we're just putting in the big elements. This isn't a detailed drawing with all the trees and everything drawn in. I just want to place things where I want them. So I'm placing the, pl the path where that's going to be. I'm placing the line uh, at the back of the shadowed area. I'm placing the line of the uh, back trees there. So the next thing after you get that real simple drawing is to start from the back and move forward. So I'm starting with the sky and I'm just using a little ultramarine blue and white, quite a bit of titanium white there, and a larger brush, maybe about a half inch uh, brush. You want to make sure your brush is firm enough that it will push the paint around. You don't want a really soft watercolor type of brush. So this will be the first layer here. We call this the block in. Uh, I'm, as you paint this you'll kind of be painting in layers. First we're going to be blocking in the big areas with about the right value that we want to be using. Our focus is on value. So I took some of that medium green that they have there and some white and some ultramarine blue to mix together a 
bluish green color then I use just a tiny bit of red and what the red does in a green mixture is it neutralizes that color a little bit so it's not quite so vivid or chromatic instead it's grayed down a little bit so again I'm just blocking in these big areas I'm not using detail I just am focusing on getting the right value so value is how light or dark a color is think from black to white and all the grays in between and it's really the key to getting uh, accurate distance and realism in your painting so now we're going to the shaded area I took some of that phthalo green added a little bit of the lemon yellow now I'm adding ultramarine blue and a touch of the yellow ochre I'm just using looking for a darker value adding the blue gets it a little darker and the yellows are warming it up a little bit so that it gets to be a warmer color don't be afraid to uh, experiment with mixing your colors and seeing what the, you're going to come up with in terms of slightly different variations and subtle variations of color and that's really the key especially when you look at a scene like this that's just green on green on green so I'm adding a little bit more red into that green mixture and what the red does is it neutralizes that color grays it down a little bit you seldom want to use a color straight out of the tube but instead you're going to adjust it look at the color you're trying to match and then work on adjusting mixing and making those colors match now I've taken some of the medium green and adding both lemon yellow and yellow ochre to that and some white and I'm looking for uh, the beginnings of what is going to be some areas in in the painting that are sun, that are sunlit so lit by the sun so I'm adding even more white um, as I worked with these Arteza paints one thing I did discover is they have a little harder time in actually covering so you might have to come back and do two layers as you'll see that I do here in this painting because I'm using those Arteza paints all the way through to see how those are going to work. I have speeded up this video a little bit so that it won't take us quite as long to get through it but you can still see everything I'm doing. So there I'm taking the ultramarine blue and the crimson red. I added white to it that gives us a purple and then I added a little bit of the yellow ochre to it to again neutralize that down. I'm looking for this shadow color here and on the pathway. So there I added a little more blue and a little more yellow ochre. Now I'm adding a little bit more crimson. Again, the key is to experiment and to mix and to try it out. Don't feel like you have to know the color is right or what the exact recipe is for a color before you put it on your canvas because color will really vary from depending on what those colors are next to so when you try your colors mix them on your palette but then go up to your painting and test them by putting them next to the other colors on the painting that's really key because the colors will change depending on what colors they're next to I'm looking for a really dark dark and I apologize for the little transparent area on the palette there it's just a function of the way I edited this video what it's doing is whenever there's a very dark color it turns it transparent so that color I mixed was from the phthalo blue and the crimson and so it's a very very black color and that's uh, that's what I'm using for my darkest darks I don't use Mars black I just don't like the way it works in a painting I think it's very dull so even though it comes in this set you you won't me see me using it instead I like to neutralize my colors using the complement and mix my own darks so here I'm coming back for the second layer of the sky and I'm using the again the ultramarine blue a little bit of phthalo blue and quite a bit of white so as you can see you kind of need that second layer for coverage when you're using these uh, less expensive paints but that's okay because it's very easy to cover with acrylics they dry that sky was already dry from the time that we started which was just a matter of a couple of minutes so I'm basically just starting back at the back and moving forward again now that we've got the block in done or all of our basic values and approximate colors so I've gone back and mixed this this neutralized green color again 
And now I'm using a brush stroke that is giving me a softer edge along the top. I'm kind of scribbling the brush in round circular motions in order to give a kind of a top that looks like the top of trees there. Uh, and just trying to keep it softened up. Okay, adding a little more white and a little more yemen, lemon yellow to that mixture. And you can see that that just gives you some little subtle feelings like that there is something going on back in that back hill. You don't want detail back there, you just want little subtle variations that are well blended. And I didn't have any trouble blending with these paints as you can see. Like with all acrylic paints, you need to do your blending while the paint is still wet so you can lay that paint down and immediately blend it together. Adding a little more yellow to the mixture there too, just to give it some variation in color. And that little bit of variation across that back field will make it look a little more interesting. You don't want to just leave one flat color. So adding a little more white to it gives me yet another little variation. As you build up these layers in acrylics, it, it creates texture and interest in your painting. Uh, so don't feel like you just have to lay down one layer and then it's done. Now I've taken the paint off the brush and I'm just softening up that back edge. I don't want a harsh line between the tree line and the uh, back field back there because it's it's in the distance. So by just blending that while it's still wet, wiping the paint off my brush and blending it a little bit, uh, it gives it that soft transition so you don't have that hard edge back there. You want to save your hard edges for the front, not the back. So starting in again here, with my dark, some phthalo blue, some of the crimson, and some of the yellow ochre to work in some of those darks and to start create the, creating the area where the trees are going to be. I'm still using a brush that's, oh, about 3 eighths of an inch wide. I guess it's a flat brush. And you notice I'm just putting plenty of paint on my brush, going back with each stroke just about to reload it. And I'm creating those uh, lines for the trunks using a stop and start motion. I'm pulling it, think of pulling it up. Be firm with your brush stroke and the stopping and starting gives some change of direction to your trunk so it doesn't look so uh, sort of artificial and rigid. It gives you more of a feeling of little elbows where the branches of the trees will be coming off of there. Still using that same dark uh, and laying in those colors. I did wait until that background was was dry to the touch. Uh, if it's if it's a little bit wet, it's going to be kind of sticky, so you don't want that. Adding some white and some yellow ochre to that. So when you get up further in the tree, you're going to go lighter with your color. Plus, as you notice in the reference uh, painting up there, this trunk has lots of different little subtle changes in color. But right now I'm focusing on just being sure that those shapes are filled in. You don't see any little gaps where the uh, brush has jumped over and the background showing through. You don't want to have a transparent tree trunk there. That wouldn't be too good. So I'm just blending those together, filling in the gaps. The important thing when you're doing tree trunks like this is to be sure to vary your size and to vary uh, your distance between the trunks. You don't want to, our natural tendency is to line everything up and you want to be really careful not to do that. So adding uh, some more phthalo blue, some more yellow ochre, some more ultramarine blue, just playing with getting some different colors of uh, gray basically. Slightly different values, uh, some darker, some lighter. Some color a little bit bluer, some a little bit warmer or more red. And basically just every time you have to go back to your palette um, and you've used up you know, some of the paint, you can always just mix a little bit of another color in there. Adding some more of that also to the shadowed area of the path. I'm looking for those shadow colors. Um, Acrylics tend to dry a little bit darker than when you put them down on the canvas. So you want to be really careful to try to get the right value. Adding a little more titanium white there, you'll find that 
uh, you use more white than anything else in your painting and that's true with this type of paint as well I discovered. Okay, now I've switched over to my uh, long thin liner brush and when you're using a liner brush you're going to want to add more water to your paint and then I using that to create these smaller branches. Again going back often to uh, refill your brush and I'm pulling those branches upwards. Think of pulling them upwards. Be sure you have lots of paint and again using that stop and stop stop and start motion so that it creates little elbows in the uh, in the branches and makes them look a little bit more natural. You can also come down from the top. You want to keep keep that brush fairly loose in your hand so that uh, you can you can create these more organic um, shapes. So this is an even smaller uh, flat brush. You could use a flat, a filbert. It's not super critical. Whatever brush you have on hand works well. But you know when you're working with these acrylics, you you do want to use the firmer brushes. So if you're having trouble moving the paint along, it's because you're you're you don't have a firm enough brush. You don't want to use watercolors type brushes. You want the more firmer synthetic uh, brushes. So I'm coming in here with a light. It's the titanium white with a little bit of yellow ochre added just to warm it up. You're very rarely going to use titanium white on its own because it's pretty chalky and it uh, it's kind of cool and so you want to get that little bit warmer tone. But I also know I'm going to have to come back with a few layers to this. So I know that whatever I'm putting down now I'm kind of covering that very dark with this very light color just to begin the process of the coverage of the dark because I know I'll have to come in with another layer as you can see it doesn't cover completely so if you're having troubles with your less expensive paints um, and you're worried about them not covering don't worry about that just come back in with another layer it will be dry momentarily so no worries there here I'm trying out some of the uh, earth colors that come in this set. I think that was burnt sienna that I used with some white and making browns. I don't normally use these kind of pre-mixed earth tones in my paintings because I like color and I'd rather mix them together myself. But they are kind of uh, save you some time when you're when you're mixing your neutrals. You can you can use those brown earth tones, the burnt sienna and uh, the yellow ochre and those those more brown burnt umber I think is the other one yeah so I added a little more of the scarlet to that brown because I just wanted to give it more color I didn't want it to be quite so neutral and then laid in a little bit of that here and there in the tree trunks to get some browns then adding some titanium white to get a lighter value of that You'll notice the light is coming from the left hand side in this picture. So it's hitting that left hand side of the tree trunks and then it's creating some dappled light on the path. So I want not only in the shadow areas but in the light areas, I'm going to want a variety of lighter tones. The key is the right value. So as long as you stay in those light values, you are then going to want to change up your color to get that texture going on. Here I'm back to the shadow values and after putting in some of those mid-tones and those lights now I'm coming back in with some of the darks and really that's what you know the whole process is about in this type of painting is just this layering techniques so if you put something down the first time and you go oh that didn't work don't worry about erasing it or thinking that you've ruined your painting because you haven't. You can just come back with more layers and uh, add more texture to it later. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just reshaping those trunks, making sure I have them all filled in so you can't see any of the background through them, making sure that I have a variety of thicknesses of those trunks, so some thin, some thicker, and then just varying up those values. You can work for a while uh, like this, adding some red there to the gray. If the paint starts feeling like it's getting gummy, like it's kind of pulling up the layers below and getting a little sticky, then just 
stop for a moment or two, let that layer dry, and then come back with another layer. That's really key. When you start getting that gumminess, picking up the layers below and creating sort of a gummy texture, just stop for a minute or two, move to another part of your painting and come back and let that layer dry. And then you'll have no trouble with it. So just adding some more crimson to that, some more yellow ochre, making that darker dark color. So I came back with the mediums. You notice I'm keeping the darks on the right side of the trunks and at the base of the trunks primarily because that's the side that's in the shadow. I'm using horizontal strokes and I'm using vertical strokes and I'm not going over and brushing, brushing, brushing the same stroke. Instead, just lay that stroke down, come back later and add more strokes, but don't overwork each stroke as you put it down. Just lay it down and, and move on. Using some of that green, that phthalo green and the yellow ochre. So now I'm going back into creating um, more of these textures in the shadowed area of, of the grass. Adding phthalo blue to that to give it, make it a more blue green. Again, you don't want to use those colors straight out of the tube. You really want to look at the color you're trying to match and then work on mixing your colors. It's really a process of do I need it to be bluer? Do I need it to be warmer? Here I'm using my small round bristle brush. It's a very old brush. It's all kind of ragtaggy and and that's that's good because it creates these soft little uh, organic looking varied shapes. So you can notice I'm using it on the side. The brush, the brush is on the side and I use both a rolling motion and a tapping motion and a flicking motion very lightly touching the canvas. Some of my other videos uh, you can see more of this technique in use. Here I've gone back to my long thin liner brush. Again when you use this brush be sure to add more water to your paint to make it flow more easily off of the brush. By stroking back and forth on your palette you create a fine tip, a fine point to that brush. Um, you want to get a liner brush that is just the thinnest one that you can find. The, brush, the bristles are very long and there's not very many of them. So back to that small round bristle brush with the rolling motion to just add more textures. You can see it just adds a little texture. You've got some of the lines going on. I wanted to show the area where the grasses are meeting the sunlit grass so you see those darker grasses uh, coming up into the area. And mostly you don't have to worry about putting little tiny grasses all over your painting. Instead focus on the edges where the light meets the dark. That's where you're going to really see those, uh, those little marks there. So I'm checking there to see if the if the background and the trunk area is uh, dry enough to start working on some leaves. I've got that narrow flat brush there and some phthalo green and yellow ochre. So I'm just laying those in and now I've started with a fresh palette because I had to quit for the day and let so that whole area is dry and now I'm working on uh, adding some more layers. I started with the blue there and I was just trying to get some those shadows more blue in color so I added a little bit of that. Now I've gone to the green with a little yellow ochre, a little lemon yellow and white. So I'm working on lightening up that background uh, before I go you want to finish that background before you go and put your layers of uh, leaves on top so I'm here I'm reshaping that tree trunk. I didn't like the way the tree sh trunk was shaped. It wasn't looking good to me so I'm going back and reshaping it by painting in the background around it. And so again I have to remix some of the those background hills with the blue, the green, uh, a little bit of red and some white and that so that I can continue to reshape that trunk and thin that out a little bit. 
Remember, acrylics dry a little bit darker, so if you're trying to match a color exactly, you want to make sure that the color you're putting down looks lighter than the color that is dried on the canvas already. So that's pretty important. So coming in with some phthalo green again, yellow ochre, white, and I'm using the yellow ochre in there because I don't want I want the I want the green to be to stay vivid up in these close areas. We don't want the green to be too neutral, but we want it to be warm. So I'm adding even more yellow ochre here. Again, it's it's trial and error. So what I'm doing, I'm going to do in a moment here, is I want to see if these paints, um, I'm, I'm noticing that there's some transparency to them as I'm trying to put these thick brush strokes down. And I want to compare them in a moment here to the golden acrylic paints that I tend to, uh, that I use in, all, in my other paintings. So what I did was I went ahead and put out some, some yellows and some blues and some greens that I would use in golden acrylic paints and mixing up a very similar color here so I can just compare the covering ability of the Arteza paints versus the golden. Um, so you can see that the golden do color a little more. I think the key is in the titanium white. The, the golden titanium white is just a little more opaque. Um, going back now and mixing up the Arteza paints to compare to them again. Well, the, the, what I came up with there was just the concept that yes I think the Goldens do cover a little bit better but not enough better. Here, here is a version very similar in color but in the Arteza brand and as you can see they cover the Golden covers a little better but not enough better to give up on using these uh, Arteza paints because they're very much less expensive and I really think they will encourage you to paint more and to not worry about the cost of your paints. So it was good to test those right next to each other to just see if I was losing too much in coverage and I really don't feel like I am. I'm getting the colors I want and by just doing another layer uh, in areas that are looking too transparent I can solve that problem. So I'm back to all the Arteza paints now, and this is the Thalo Green with some white added. The key in, in doing a painting like this that's just green on green on green is just to vary up your colors of green. So there's just an infinite variety of infinite variety of colors of green that can you can use. So now I'm using a bluer green, and those bluer greens next to the lighter greens will also the warmer greens will also create more depth in your painting. The cooler colors will recede and the warmer colors will come forward. So going back to white with a little bit of that yellow ochre added in to warm it up and creating another layer of my shadow on the ground colors. And you can see with this second layer of the of the whites, of the light colors, it's really covering quite quite nicely and I'm getting all the background dark covered up. So coming in and restating the lights on the trees again the, the light is coming from the left so it's hitting the left side of those trees. So you have this little back and forth. There's yellow ochre with some red added and I'm using some of those other uh, earth tones across the top to neutralize that a little bit and some white added. This gives me sort of a peachy red color to use along the periphery of the shadow. So a shadow will go from, I mean a, a sunlit patch will go from a very light center and then it will come out to a, a, a little bit darker around the edges of the light center and then it'll move into the shadow area. So it isn't just straight light on dark but you get this transition from light to dark by using those other uh, colors in between. I'm still using kind of a thick brush here. I mean it's not it's not a very small brush and that's the key to getting this more impressionistic loose style. Don't go to those little tiny brushes and, and move in uh, real closely to your canvas. Instead try to stick to the biggest brush you can and still get the the small shapes you're looking for. Laying down those colors, give, I'm giving uh, some variety in the lights now. Adding some more white 
and a little bit more red there. A little this time I'm adding a little bit more yellow. So you can see that's just creates variations of light. About the same value, but different colors, slightly different colors that creates that fun texture. Now going in with some of the medium green, adding yellow ochre and white again, because I do have areas in in the grass there that are also lit by the sun. So that's going to be a different color. <clears throat> okay, adding some sunlit uh, leaves here. Again, don't worry about creating exact leaf shapes. You can tell I'm laying that brush down flat and I'm moving it a little bit. I'm not drawing an exact leaf shape. I'm just using the shape of the brush and the edge of the brush to create some shapes that have edges to them. We talked about soft edges in the background and now in the foreground you're going to want to leave some hard edges. So that means areas that aren't blended out, patches of paint, brush strokes that have an edge to them where you can clearly see where that brush stops and uh, another color begins. So that's what we mean when we talk about edges. Again, just creating little brush strokes with edges. Another one thing you want to be careful of is not to create a polka dot pattern with these lighter leaves. And by that I mean don't evenly distribute little light dots throughout your leaf area. Instead, create a little path for the eye that connects these light areas as they go across your painting. So coming back in with the dark color to create some of those smaller uh, leaves that are overlapping into the light area. Remember you're going to get the most bang for your buck as it were by having dark against light and light against dark. So you want to be sure to just in a few areas create those dark leaves against the light background. And we'll come back and forth with this area to kind of hone it and refine it. So don't feel like you, it has to be exact there. Or don't worry if the shape you put down wasn't quite, quite right. At this point, just move on and let that area dry. So again, I've created that very dark uh, color to use on the side. I know it looks lighter on the palette. Again, that's because of my transparency issue there. But this is just as dark as I can get it. You can do that with the uh, thalo green and the crimson red. You can do it with your thalo blue and a little bit of yellow ochre and a little bit of crimson red. Anytime you mix complementary colors like that, you're going to get a neutral color and it's going to be very dark. So there I added a little bit of that burnt sienna in with the color to warm it up a little bit. You can tell how I'm refining the uh, that forward trunk there, the shapes that are being created between the light and the dark and just the texture on the trunk. Something that helps me a lot when I'm painting is just to squint my eyes as I'm looking at the painting. That way I don't get caught up in the little tiny detail, but I can see more how the painting will look from a distance, which is really important. So squint, take the time to step back from your painting. Remember, I've, this is sped up to about two times speed. I actually take more time to step back and look and ponder the uh, things that I put down. More, more looking, less painting will always help you out. Using this liner brush again to create some loose, light colored uh, strokes of a few grasses here and, and there. Again, you don't need to paint in every piece of grass in uh, the painting. As you can tell where the light grasses overlap the dark grasses and where the dark grasses overlap the la light grasses, those are the key areas. I've gone back to that small round bristle brush to just put in some some shapes, some random organic organic shapes down towards the bottom. Here and there I'm using a mid-tone, uh, a slightly, I wouldn't say mid-tone, but slightly darker uh, color of green there. Mixing that up with the, my two greens, adding a little bit of the burnt sienna, which is a nice color there to uh, 
help neutralize that color. That's one of those earth tones on the palette. Experiment with these colors. Do, do your swatches before you start the paint. Just get some watercolor paint, paper and play with these colors. Mix them together and, and see, what you, uh, see what you can do with them. And you'll be really glad you did once you get into the painting. So some of that burnt sienna and some blue, some red. I'm making more of that purpley color uh, for the shadows, and this is a slightly more red color. Reshaping the highlight areas. You notice how I'm holding my brush on the side, and I'm doing very horizontal strokes across the canvas. Whenever you're working on a path like this, where you're creating a flat horizontal surface, you want to work in these horizontal brush strokes. Added some white to that and some more blue to get a, a bluer, lighter version of that shadow color. Remember these uh, colors are going to dry darker. So on your shadow side, you also want to bring that blue color in, that blue shadowy color. Whenever you have a, a dark area of a tree trunk like that, you're actually going to get the sky reflecting into the shadows and up onto your tree trunk. So that's why you want to add those blue colors into, the, into your shadow. Don't just leave it all dark. So here I'm using some yellow ochre, some white to create the shadow. Some yellow, so some, these are like little yellow flowers in the shadow. So they're darker and they're more neutral. Now I'm taking the lemon yellow and some white just to create those same flowers but what they would look like in sunlight. So you notice how I'm moving my brush. One thing that we can tend to do, if you hold your brush in the exact same position, you're going to get exactly the same mark on the canvas and it's going to start looking too uniform. So one way to get around that is to be sure to rotate your brush onto its tip sometimes and sometimes just move your hand completely around. Rotate your hand like I'm doing there. And what that does is creates a different shape with your brush because you don't want those shapes to be all the same all going the same direction. Adding some of that light, light yellow color also to the background to uh, create that shape, the lightness back there. So taking my ultramarine blue and my crimson creates somewhat of a purple color there. Again, we don't have a really bright purple in this set, but you can create a purple with those two. And this darker version of the purple is going to be uh, some purple flowers in shadow. So there's going to be some shadow at the base, down at the, the shadowed base of areas. So just look where you've already established your light and your dark. And within the light areas too, you're also going to have some of that dark color because a flower itself will have shadow within it. So I added some white to that color there to uh, get a lighter version of, of the purple. Again, you can see it's a, it's a really neutral purple. I'm adding some more blue to it there to try to get a little bit more color in it, but you're not going to get a really bright purple with this set, but it works very well in landscapes and uh, for landscape colors there. So, so you can see I took that slightly lighter color of, of purple and I just dabbed that over the top where the dark colors were. And that's really all you need is a couple, two, maybe three values if you want to do that. Uh, adding a little more white here again. You want to be sure that your white stays clean and as you use it up, uh, don't be afraid to stop and add more white. It's easy to get kind of lazy and just want to try to find a little bit of clean paint left in there, but give yourself a stop and add your, your clean paint so you get nice clear colors. And especially working in this, uh, this sunlit area, these little sunlit patches, um, I want to be sure to get that. So as, as you can see, this is probably my third or fourth uh, layer of light. And with e each layer, um, I'm, I'm using a smaller brush. This is a small round brush right now, a synthetic, not the bristle one, which was all kind of bumpy and rough looking. This is just a small round uh, synthetic brush to get my smaller and smaller shapes. And with each layer, you're refining those shapes 
a little bit more to, to be what you want them to be. So again, don't worry about it. If you put, put down something and you don't like it, don't worry. Just let it dry and come back with another shape. You notice I'm trying, I'm really trying to create little tiny areas and bigger areas. Vary up those areas so that uh, all the shapes aren't the same. In the, in, the, in the background you're going to get more elliptical, long thin shapes and then in the foreground the shapes are be going to become more rounded. Uh, that just is the perspective as you're looking back down there. So now adding some more white to that light green to just put a few touches of a lighter color both in the leaves and in my sunlit area of flowers. Again, you notice I'm not over brushing these. That's so critical with your brush strokes. Lay them down and leave them. Come back later if you don't like them, but don't brush over and over the same brush stroke. That creates a, a, a look that just looks overworked. And just lay them down and you'll find that if you move around the canvas, keep keep the brush loose and I like to listen to music. I always listen to music when I'm painting because it creates sort of an unthinking rhythm to your brush strokes so you don't get too tight. That's really key to loosening up is just to loosen up. <laughs> loosen up your hold on the brush and loosen up your movements. Move around and just lay in those brush strokes. You notice I've come back in now with the dark again. So there's, um, there's, there's movement from light to dark to light to dark and continually refining down. By refining I mean my brush strokes are getting smaller and they're getting more accurate and, they're, and I'm spending more time to look at the painting and decide which areas are still bothering me. So as far as this leaf area, my, my goal here is to just get a lot of different shapes and colors in here. I'm staying mostly within the darker colors so that it can contrast against that light background. But I do have those few areas, that one area near the opening there, especially where I've got a few of the lighter leaves. You don't want to spread those all over. Again, as I said, you want to draw the eye and give the eye a pathway to follow around in your painting. So we have those light areas, a few of them to the left to kind of grab the eye and then you move over into the leaves and into the focal area which is this area where you look out into the into the sunlit grasses there. Back with a medium tone, more yellow ochre in it. That, that yellow ochre is is really turned out to be a great color in this set in terms of making a warmer green and, a, and it neutralizes the green a little bit at the same time and a more neutral green looks more natural. If you use a green straight out of the tube it's not going to look like uh, very real. It's going to have a not quite so real look to it. So here adding some green that is actually less neutralized, a little more bright here and there. And you can tell this combination of the brighter greens, the lighter greens, creates that texture. Adding more blue to that shadow color, that lighter shadow color, and again lightening up that shadow. You want to be careful not to get your shadows too dark. That's something that's easy to happen in acrylic paints, especially when you're, you're using a photo for reference because often photos We'll just take your dark areas and just make them black. So I'm continually keeping an eye as the paint dries on those shadow areas and where they're too dark I'm just coming back in with an even lighter version and restating that those colors. You can tell that trunk is really starting to get some nice textures going on and it's not because I drew anything in specifically. I just keep adding those layers with the slight subtle changes in color, making sure that I'm keeping the value in the light all lighter than the values in the dark on the, those two sides of the trees. And it creates that texture. Coming back in with my greens, just 
adding some random green strokes in there at the bottom of these uh, these tree trunks adding some light you can see where that light of the uh, tree is hitting the tree you'd also have some light there okay so starting with my phthalo blue and adding some white to it and again I have that transparency problem in the phthalo blue and in the dark green on the palette there but it it's a uh, that's what's up there. So what I'm doing with this thalo blue and the white is I'm going to come back in and reshape some of these uh, these leaves. The leaves there have gotten really dense and the, the shapes are oh, just kind of, you know, I just want to refine those shapes and make them more interesting in the leaves. Create smaller shapes and bigger shapes and, you, and I do that by coming back in with the background color and painting around the colors. That's called negative painting when you paint the space around the color. And you can tell how by doing this I can really create some more uh, an impression of some more organic looking shapes in there, more complicated shapes than they are. So I'm just putting them in there. I wanted it especially to be lighter right around that opening area. You can see in the reference uh, painting there that I did that there too. Um, but all throughout the painting I want to create that. Uh, one of the things I really liked about this scene was that sort of lacy look of the dark leaves against the light, the sunlit background. So coming back in and recreating. Now when you do this color um, and you do this kind of sky holes we call them, you want to be sure that your paint is a little bit darker than your actual background. When you're making these little tiny spots, if they're too light, they really pop out with all the dark around them and, uh, and they turn into like these little headlights. So when you're creating the color to use for uh, creating sky holes, you want the color to be just a little bit darker than the actual sky. I did the same thing mixing up uh, that background hills color again and painting in and around the leaves and the shapes that I've created to the goal being to create some a variation in this size. Before all my brush strokes were pretty similar in size I was using the same brush but uh, so this is how you do that is come back in and paint around those shapes and you notice I'm just I'm, I'm not painting leaf shapes but I'm leaving these little like corner shapes sticking out that that give you the impression of a of a leaf here and there sticking out or a group of leaves um, by having those edges in there again with with these paints if you're having trouble with coverage don't worry about it in in this area over here I did end up with a little you can see that background through but we'll just come back with another layer to fix that so starting with my medium green adding the yellow ochre and the lemon yellow uh, and some white which is some of those background colors you notice how I tested that first you again you can't tell by looking at your palette if the color is right you have to take that color and put it up on the on your painting next to the other colors that are always there. It's just a trick of the eye against that palette. You can it can look very different. So working on creating doing the same thing with the background color here of the sky and making all these little shapes smaller and and more varied. Again, if you have trouble with your paint starting to gum up or it's not covering don't just keep doing it but let that dry and come back which is what I'm doing here I'm letting that area dry a little bit because it was I didn't have as much coverage as I wanted but I could tell it was just starting to lift and and wasn't giving me the effect that I wanted so I just left that dry a little moment the other key is that when we get into these top layers be sure you use lots of paint on your brush. Don't skimp on your paint uh, there. You want to use lots of it. And just make sure your brush is loaded and then lay that down, lay that brush stroke down and leave it there. 
I wanted a little bit of a transition color, a more green green color between the light and the dark in, in, the, in the shadow area. So I've mixed up some of a little bit of both of the greens, adding some yellow to that until I get a color that just here and there I'm going to add that really bright vivid green color. And you know I'm doing this in the foreground area, not in the background area. That's where you want to save your most chromatic colors and by chromatic I mean brightest most vivid colors for the uh, front and I'm adding a few of those two into the leaves of that more bright vivid green and you notice lots of paint on my brush I'm using that small round brush the synthetic not the bristle so I can get a nice crisp edge and I'm putting lots of paint adding more of that phthalo green to it and yellow ochre that'll give me a darker version of that. So now as you can see I'm coming back into that area where I'm just trying to get that little bit of a lacy look of those trees of those leaf, dark leaves against the light and now I'm putting in little tiny marks getting that variety of size of your marks is really key because the leaves that are closest to us are going to be bigger and then there's going to be leaves that are far away peeking through and those are going to be very much smaller and that difference in size helps you with your your perspective and you're feeling like that there's a three-dimensional uh, scene going on here now this is the foreground area so I'm using some bigger shapes some big bold leaf shapes just a few of them here and there I don't want to overdo but I do want to make sure I have a variation of size from bigger to smaller. So you have variations in color, variations in value, variations in size. All those things are the tools that you use to create uh, distance. Coming back in with just a touch of that lighter, it's, it's a more, not quite as yellow as some of the other light greens that we've used. So you can see how many varieties you can get of that uh, of greens to make up a scene like this and wherever I put have that green I'm going to touch it in here and there throughout the canvas in in this in the foreground areas because that's where that green can be seen coming back in with some darks as well to uh, to just touch those in we're getting close to the end of this little painting I hope that you have enjoyed this process of using these Arteza paints to create an impressionistic landscape. Um, they worked out very well for me and I really would recommend them for a beginner or just if you want a lower cost alternative to uh, encourage you to paint more and not worry about um, the, the cost of those things which is super important. I mean as a beginner you want to set your goal on painting a hundred paintings. That's what I did when I first started. Don't judge yourself. Don't get worried about whether or not you're good enough to paint. Wait till you've painted a hundred paintings and then decide if you want to keep painting. And I'm pretty sure you will because what it takes is just time at the easel, time focusing on developing your skills and your techniques, and uh, and it's entirely possible to do. It's it's nothing magical. There's nothing magical about painting. It's not something you're either born with or not, but instead it's something that you can develop over time. Coming back with an even bluer and even lighter version uh, of that shadow color. Again, leaving some of the dark area, but lightening it up. Take your time at this point to step back, let the painting dry for a day or two, leave it where you can see it as you're walking around the house, and just glance at it. Take a look and say, to find out what you like and what you don't like, and uh, just what areas draw your eye, and what areas just make you feel like, that's not quite right. It's not a, it's, there's no right or wrong, it's just what looks good to you, and what makes you happy. So that's what in this part of the painting I've done is just 
you know, step back. There were areas where I'd put the sky in right on top of a branch and kind of like the branch disappeared all of a sudden. So I'm painting back in those branches, making sure that there aren't any areas where the paint looks, you know, not completely filled in. I decided to put shadow back right there against that that back edge instead of having it light right up to the edge. Uh, but yeah, this has been a fun little painting and I hope you uh, enjoy painting it as well. And I'd love to hear in the comments how your painting went. And of course, always if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you get the new videos as they first come out. So here I've come back with one more layer in that area where I felt like it wasn't covering. And again, using lots of paint, that area was dry already. I tested it to make sure it was dry. And then it's easy enough just to fill in that area and get make sure that it's covered completely. There I'm just adding a little more of that color to create some variation. Just a few touches here and there, some of the light green. Again, you'll notice that things will tend to dry darker, especially your lights. So don't be afraid uh, to come back in and just restate those lights and add another layer. That is the beauty of acrylics, is you can put layer on layer on layer. And people often ask, well, when is it done? Well, it's done when it pleases you. So there's no exact spot, but if it makes you happy and you look at it and nothing draws your eye, you can just you decide when it's done. And it's also a matter of taste. Some people would like to stop much sooner in the process, which, and some people would like to go on to even more small shapes, more refined shapes, and that's what makes up detail. It's not starting from the beginning with every tiny thing. It's it's honing in from the big shapes to the small shapes, to the more refined colors, values, shifts, until you get the level of realism that you want. But remember, the focus is on the values, getting the correct values, and just getting the right shape, the right color, in the right place with the right edge. So that's it for our little painting today, and I'm glad you could join me. And we'll see you again soon in another acrylic painting tutorial. Bye-bye for now.